Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to worship here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church. My name is Scott Gentry. I'm the lead pastor here. So greetings to every one of you who are with us today. When I have looked so forward to being with you today. Hello to each one of you. Hey, uh, I'm waving to you. You want to wave back? Just because it's so good to be together, drawing strength from God together. And I hope that you sense that we as a church genuinely care for you. We pray for you. We are so glad that we can be a part of this online service together. Hey, let's do this as we begin. Just kind of take a breath. And just to realize this, God is with me right now, right, right where you are. He's ready to meet with you, ready to help you to draw strength from him today. He is even ready to help you give praise to him. Isn't that cool? Just to think about that as we gather together. Hey, if you're with us today as a person that this is your regular place to gather for worship online, thanks for being here. It means so much to us that you are a part of this time. We are so glad that we can be able to have this service together. If you're with us for the first time, thanks for joining with us. I hope that you enjoy today's service. It's meaningful to you. Hope that you'll just make this a place you'll come back again and again to be able to worship together and draw strength from God. Hey, I know we're not physically in the same room, but we are gathering together today as God's people. And where you are at this very moment, I want you to think about this. Your, your house right now, it really is the house of the Lord. I mean, it's not the place that we're assembling together, you know, in the, the same room physically as, as the church, but we are meeting together right now as the church. I love this scripture from Psalm 121. In verse one, King David said this. He said, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. You know, for us today, we say something like this. I, I was glad when we, when we said, hey, let's meet together to worship online with God's people, to be together with God's people. I was glad to be able to connect with others in my church family to worship God together. And that's what we're going to do today. And I'm just so glad that you're a part of this. Psalm 27, 4 says this, one thing I have asked of the Lord I, that I seek after, that I may dwell in in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This worshiper said, I just want to be able to come to worship God, to be able to look at God, see God, ask God things, and just to be able to enjoy his presence. What a beautiful picture. Well, friends, one day we are all going to be together with the Lord forever. Uh, no limitations, nothing to stop each and every one of us from worshiping God in his very presence with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I love this thought too. And we'll be doing that with the church from all over the world throughout all time. That includes our loved ones who have gone before us, who are worshiping God right now, who love Jesus and are there waiting for us. One day we're going to be together again, uh, celebrating God. What a day that's going to be. So I hope that this morning that you have joy in your heart and that you are ready to be able to sing praise to God. I, I pray you're ready to shout out your praise to God because I'm telling you, there's joy in this place because of Jesus. Let's pray together and then let's enter into this time of worship. God, thank you for allowing us to be here today. Help us to understand your presence with us, God. Help us to understand your nearness, the help that you want to give to each person right now, wherever they find themselves, whatever their circumstance. Lord, as they, they participate now in this worship service, I pray worship comes from their heart to you. Be able to say, thank you, God. I praise you, God. I, I trust you, God. And that, God, that we would genuinely meet with you. We would genuinely hear from you. We draw strength from being with you and being together today. So bless this time, God. We come to bring you our praise right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise the Lord together right now. Put your hands together. Yeah. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea.
the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is Good morning, church. My name is Pastor Bryce, and I'm the youth pastor here at Philadelphia Methodist Church. Last week, we started to focus on 2 Chronicles 7.14, which says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. As, as a church, we, we want to take some time to participate in what 2 Chronicles 714 tells us. We want to take time to pray for our nation. We want to take this focus of, of turning and, and seeking God to pray for our nation. So at 714 a.m. and 714 p.m., we ask that you set aside some time. You know, 714 a.m. is a really early time for me, but to set aside some time to, to pray for our nation. You know, as, as we pray, we know that we don't pray to a cosmic ATM where we just put in whatever we want and get it out, all right? We pray to, to God who, who lives and breathes and wants us to humble ourselves and seek him and turn from our wicked ways. We, we pray to a God who actively wants relations with us and is involved in the world. So when we pray, we know that God has the power to change things. Matthew chapter 7, verse 9 through 11 says this, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you, then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Guys, as, as we pray for our nation, I want us to, to hold that in effect, if we say, hey, God, please help this violence in our nation stop, we, we know that God can do that. If we say, hey, God, please set a revival fire in our nation, we know that God can do that. And so I'm asking you to join us at 7.14 a.m. and 7.14 p.m. to pray for our nation. We have a sign here. It says, I-7.14, do you? And we're going to have this available at church. We would love to get some of your guys' pictures so we can use that and we can continue to remind ourselves as a church to pray for our nation. So thank you, and I, I hope that you join us in praying for our nation. We've all seen these posts. The inflammatory statements from friends, family, and neighbors. They can be hurtful, and they can also be genuine. Sometimes a person is authentically searching for truth. How do we help them? What do we say? How do we even start? I guess the question is, what do you do with your friends and family who don't believe that there is a God, much less believe in Jesus? How do you approach them? How do you answer them? How do you coexist? Well, friends, today we're beginning a new series that really is talking about how to thrive in our ever changing world. It's kind of loosely based upon a, uh, a book that was written quite a few years ago by a guy named Larry Osborne, who he called Thriving in Babylon. But it really is talking about how we can thrive in a culture that is changing faster and faster, becoming more dark and more godless in so many ways. Let me tell you what, why we were doing this and what happened. Just a few days ago, I was driving uh, to church coming down to work one morning, and as I came in, I was just seeing signs of our changing culture all around us. I mean, in so many different ways. I won't go into all the details of that. 
But I was just noticing just like, this has changed, this has changed, this has changed. And even when I drove around the neighborhood, kind of close proximity to our church campus, I was just looking at people, different things, and I began to, to think, you know, God, how are people around us viewing the church these days? And how, do, how are they thinking of you these days? And because of a lot that we've gone through, a lot of conversations that I've had, just awareness of, of what is going on in our culture, I, I realize around us, it can feel like culture is getting more and more dark. And, and if we're at one time, the church in general, especially, or just even thinking about us here in Ferndale, would be viewed so positively, overwhelmingly positively by so many, that changes and it's changing year by year by year. And in so many ways, there are some people who would look at the church kind of in general, big C church, and they may put us in this category too, that they would say, I used to view you positively, but now I don't view you as positively. And in fact, some people are just downright aggressive toward the church. You saw that in the little video intro we had coming into this message. Well, that just put my mind thinking. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at someone from the scripture who faced a completely uncertain future, but was able to deal with it and who was incredibly powerful and in fact, even incredibly successful. And that man is Daniel in the Old Testament. We know a lot about Daniel, right? We think about Daniel in the lion's den, things like that. We think about his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the, the fiery furnace. And sometimes we can think these are almost like kind of children's stories, but we're gonna look at Daniel's story because it is a real story. And we're gonna see that in the situation he found himself in, he didn't just survive, he did thrive. And as we read through his story, and as we begin to look at culture, and as we see how Daniel looked at his culture, he found himself in essentially a, a pretty godless culture. But it's amazing to see what God did in Daniel's life and through Daniel's life. And as we read his story today, we're going to learn how bad the times were in his day. We're going to see how Daniel faced some real dilemmas. And then we're going to uncouple some things that are going to be helpful for us to see how these apply directly to us as Christians living in our ever-changing culture. So let's just dive right into chapter one. The story starts out, and it says that this happened in the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah. Let me just give you a little bit of you know, understanding with that. When we think of God in the Old Testament, that God had established the, the people of God, the nation of Israel, and it was divided into 12 tribes. Now, eventually, these 12 tribes divided into two groups. There were 10 tribes and one that was the northern kingdom, and then two tribes in the southern kingdom. Now, the northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. The northern kingdom went through absolute rebellion. They eventually were uh, captured, deported, dispersed, and then they really never came back from that. They just kind of, you know, just disappeared into all the other pagan nations around them. The southern kingdom was made up of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And this, as we read into Daniel, it says that this, this king, Jehoiakim, was the king of, of Judah. Now, Jerusalem was in this southern kingdom. So when we think of the southern kingdom, we really kind of think of it as being the Israelites. I mean, the, even though that we had Israel and Judah, those two kingdoms there, but really that's the way we kind of think of it in, in, in the way we process it today. So anyway, in the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem to lay siege to it. Here's how the Bible records it. Daniel 1, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now, this is what's really important to see in, in this context, but even for us today. Did you notice who delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon? It says the Lord did. If, if you treat your Bible like a textbook, which I, I hope that you do, we study it here, this might be one of those places that you want to underline or highlight or put a note in your margin. Because when you come back to this, I don't want you to miss how incredibly powerful this important point is. And we'll flesh it out as we go on. But here's what I don't want you to miss as you see this. You have the nation of Israel, known as Judah, and they have been living basically in disobedience to God. Even though there are a lot of godly people in the nation as a whole, they're not living as God's people, all right? 
And then here comes this evil nation, Babylon, led by an evil king, Nebuchadnezzar. He attacks Jerusalem. This is God's holy city. And contrary to what we think will happen, God delivers them over to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel 1 verse 2 says, And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. So in other words, Nebuchadnezzar comes, he attacks Jerusalem, he he conquers it. He goes right into the temple, the holy temple of, uh, of Israel, right there in Jerusalem. And he takes the holy things that have been placed there to worship God, uh, things that, that God has said, these are holy, things that were from previous battles there. And he takes them back to Babylonia and he puts them in this temple to this pagan God. Now, if we were watching this as a Hollywood movie, we would think that when they went into that temple in Jerusalem and touched these things, that God would strike them dead, right? But that's not what happened. God didn't stop them. They ransacked the temple and they carried all of these things back to Babylonia. Nebuchadnezzar put those up like trophies in the temple of this God of Babylon. They were plunder. I mean, he did this to say, look, the, the God of the Israelites, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, look, he's worthless. He's, he's powerless. We conquered him. We, we have these things here. We put them on display in our museum to show how weak he is. So that's what's going on here. And I don't want you to miss, again, who allowed this. The Lord allowed it. So let's read on. Verse 3 and 4 says, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, king of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. So when they plundered Jerusalem, they didn't just take back gold and treasures. They took kind of like the cream of the crop of Israel's people. Some of these, it says they were actually from the royal family. These were like the Rhodes Scholars. These were, you know, the, the, the stars, the, you know, the, the best athletes here. Those were who were strong, they're handsome, quick to understand things, able to one day serve in King Nebuchadnezzar's court. Verse 4 says he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Now, this is really important, especially when we think about our culture today. The language and the literature of the Babylonians. The people who studied in these, these settings, the language and the literature, again, these were court officials here. But we know from history that this involved, particularly for Babylon, the study of astrology, particularly the study of what we would call the dark arts, the occult. The Babylonians were essentially the inventors of dark, this dark magic and the occult that we see even, you know, in the world today. And so that's what Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the brightest of all these from Israel were brought back to be, to study, to be indoctrinated with these things. Daniel's story continues in verse five. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Going on, it says, among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And it says that they were to be given food in their thinking fit for a king. This is right by the king's table. And they were all going to one day serve him, be trained for three years, be indoctrinated, and then come in and serve in the, the king's court. Now it says that they were given these new names. So Daniel's name was changed to Belshazzar. So here's what's interesting. His Hebrew name meant God is my judge. But this new name, it's a Babylonian name that meant Baal's prince. I mean, think of that. We're told in verse 8 that, that, that Daniel, I mean, as he goes through, he's processing all of these things, he says, look, 
I, you're changing my name. You're, you're trying to change my diet. There's, there's some things I, I don't want to go along with here. He says, I, want, I don't want to defile myself with this royal food because there were things that they were to be fed that he said, these are, are going to be contrary to Jewish dietary laws. And they plus they've been offered to these pagan gods. And Daniel literally says, I, I can't stomach these things. What's interesting is he talked to this chief official and he said, look, here's what I'd like you to do. I've got these rules, these dietary guidelines. I don't want to do this. I don't want to eat this food. Is there any way around this? I could, could use your help. Now, notice this, and this is really going to be important later. In verse 9, the scriptures tell us, Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. I mean, that's important. This court official in Nebuchadnezzar's you know, kingdom, he basically looks at Daniel and he says, I like this guy. I mean, there's something about him that, that I like. But he also said, look, Daniel, I'm afraid of the king. I mean, he's the one that says you need to be fed these things. What if you start to, you know, uh, you know, show weakness here? What if you look worse than the other guys? So, you know, I'd love to help you, but I can't risk it. I mean, he would have my head if, if you, that happens. So how did Daniel respond? He didn't respond back and throw a fit or anything like that. But what he does is he thinks it through. And he says, let me give you a little proposition. In verse 12, it says, Daniel said, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he says, let's, let's just try it. I, let's, have, let's have a vegetarian diet, water, just you know, things to eat that we think would be good for us. And then you be the judge. No big deal. No harm, right? So this guy agrees. And at the end of this 10-day trial, Daniel and his companions, I mean, they look healthier, better nourished than any of the other young men who are eating this, quote, royal food. And so the guard now, he says, I'm going to take away the king's food and I'll let you eat and survive on this vegetarian diet. And I know for some of you, that sounds really good. I mean, I like a lot of fresh vegetables, but man, I mean, no ice cream, no chips and salsa. <laughs> well, <laughs> we won't go there. Going on is verse 17. It says this. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Now, that's something else that I want you to pay attention to. And you may even want to underline that in your Bible. This is another one of those places I think you could put an important note. Who gave them all of this understanding? So as God did, God gave them knowledge and understanding of what? And it was this literature and all that they were learning. And what were they studying? Well, again, they were studying astrology and even these things related to these dark arts. Now, this doesn't mean that they embraced those things. But what it means was that they learned all about the culture around them. They learned what people were thinking and, and their thought processes and their logic. They were able to look and see the flaws in those things. They became really kind of the tops in their class of studying all this stuff. They said, we're here. This is our reality. We are going to learn all that we can. And that's a good word for us today because in our changing culture around us, we can pull ourselves back and try to pull completely away from culture. Or we can say, we need to really understand what's going on, how people are thinking, and how they're viewing things, and what, how, you know, what do they view as, as truth, and what are they basing that on? At the end of their training, they were presented to King Nebuchadnezzar, okay? So this three years goes by. And then the scriptures tell us that the king talked with them, interviewed them, looked at them, and he said, he found no one who equaled Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. All right? So they enter into the king's service. And in fact, they became excellent in their knowledge and their understanding of all these things. Verse 20 says, in every manner of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Not just the people that had been you know, brought in there as captives, not, not just those. He says, of the entire kingdom, they understood things better than anyone. Folks, again, it's a, it's a reminder to us as Christians that God says, understand, do your very best in, in every area that you find yourself in, in your schooling, in your work, study yourself to be approved, to be the very best that you can. When people look at you, they say, they are sharp, all right? They, they are ones that, that understand things. They think through things. Ten times better, in Daniel's case, than all of these people in this entire kingdom. 
Now, here's the amazing thing with Daniel's story when we think about what's happened to him. He remained in Babylon in that culture, this godless, godless culture, for over 70 years. Now, now that's kind of sobering, right? And during all of those years, here's what we read. If you read through the entire book of Daniel, and I hope that you'll do that over the, the coming week you know, or so, just open up your Bible, you know, find Daniel. Now listen, if you don't know where the book of Daniel is, God gave us an incredible gift, which is called the Table of Contents in the front of your Bible. So if you have a physical Bible, open up the Table of Contents, look it up. If you use your digital Bible, your YouVersion Bible or something like that, easy to find. So you're going to see as you read through that story that through those years, Daniel he didn't just survive. In fact, he, he thrived and God used him. He, he was elevated up to some of the highest positions in Babylon. He became a person of influence and three national revivals took place through him. And yet it all started in this time and this place that he was very uncertain about, very fearful about in a, in a culture that was completely different, completely godless just full of, of immorality. I mean, it was, it was a horrible, horrible place to find himself. Let's take a few moments just to see how bad that culture really was. You know, sometimes when we read the Bible, we forget that this is real history. When we read the story of Daniel and the lion's den, we kind of think of that as like a children's story, but this is history taking place, all right? And when we read the book of Daniel, we need to think what it would have been like to have been a 16 or a 17 year old young man that was taken out of his, his culture, kidnapped, and taken and put in this situation. Let's see how bad this really was. When you read through the whole course of the Bible, and when it comes to the darkness of the world, Babylon is basically described as the personification of evil. It's a word picture, it's a real place, a real situation, but it was so bad that consistent through the Bible, all the way up until the end of the Bible, Whenever God talks about anything being evil, dark, godless, ruthless, it's Babylon. It, it's the analogy for evil based upon the reality of what it was. Throughout the Bible, whenever God wants to say something is truly wicked, it's referred back to Babylon. I want to give you a, a picture to see how, how strong this, this is. Basically, there has never been a nation as evil as Babylon. And, and probably never will be. When you look at the last book of Revelation, all right, last book of the Bible, Revelation, this is a part that, that as we read just before Jesus returned, there have been difficult times, the world has gone through a great tribulation. Listen to how the apostle John records what's happening right at that moment. This is in Revelation chapter 18, verses one and two. John said, after this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven he had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Now, that's really interesting. He doesn't say, you know, fallen is Las Vegas, Sin City. He doesn't say fallen is like, you know, Bangkok or New York or Hollywood. He says Babylon is fallen. Now, again, what's interesting in this is Babylon, and Babylonia is a city, but you know, but Babylon is an empire. I mean, it has been destroyed. It's been gone for thousands, thousands of years. When it was finally conquered, it was never rebuilt again. And yet when the Bible talks about it, it's Jesus' return. So we have thousands of years that were, you know, before John wrote this, we've got 2,000 years since Jesus' resurrection. And then however many years that you know are still ahead, whether it be a year or a thousand years, it says here that the evil Babylon is, is fallen there. It, it represents evil. Revelation 18, 5 says, her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. Verse 10, terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour, your doom has come. So it has been represented in the Bible as the personification of evil. And then you think about King Nebuchadnezzar. Back at this time, Daniel's time, he raided God's temple. He, he took the holy things that were in the temple and he puts them on display in a demonic temple. Now you've probably been around some evil people and we read about evil people, you know, not just in the Bible, but even throughout all of life today. But when it comes to evil and as being anti-God as you can think, Nebuchadnezzar was really kind of pushing the envelope here. 
One of the things about how dark that culture was is that I, I mentioned that, that Babylon is associated with astrology and the occult. But here's what I want you to see. This is pretty amazing here. Those things, the study of the astro of astrology, the study of the occult, those were the state-sponsored religions of the time. It was the curriculum of the time. And, and, and they were forced on everyone uh, who was you know, growing up in that culture, anything in an academic setting. I think about this. Have you ever been frustrated with the educational establishment in our country? I'm sure you, you probably have. Now, I want to tell you this. It has never gone this far. I mean, things may be bad in our schools, in our public schools, but they are not this bad. We don't have anything where the state-sponsored core curriculum is the study of the occult and the dark magic and all those things. And we might be frustrated with it, and we, we should be. But boy, it is not even in sight of how dark it was back in this day. And then we add to this Daniel's own personal problems in this. I mean, he was a good guy. He'd been living his life trying to do the right things, and now he gets caught up in, in God's judgment on this entire nation of Israel. So his dilemma, a 16 or 17 year old guy, part of the royal family, born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was handsome, quick to learn, no physical defects. We learned that because he tells us that about himself, which is kind of funny. You know, when he says those that they took back were kind of like me, you know, smart, handsome, all that. But think about this, one day going from a normal guy, a good life, kidnapped, city, nation destroyed, taken to a foreign country, doesn't even know where he is forced to change his name, forced to study a foreign religion. What would that be like for us? I mean, it'd be like if we were kidnapped. We didn't know where we were blindfolded, whisked away. We find ourselves like in Mecca and we're forced to study like the Quran or Islamic studies or something like that. They change our name to a name that, that honors Allah or something. I mean, that's kind of the, the, the situation, but far worse. And so Daniel is just trying to figure all this out. So how did he do it? How, how did he thrive in the midst of that? And this, is, this is where it gets very applicable for us today, all right? The very first thing that we see as we look at Daniel throughout the, the whole story that's recorded in the Bible is this. Daniel was a man of great faith. And I'll put it this way. He was very optimistic about God. Now, you've heard me say I'm an optimistic person. My personality is kind of... I'm, I'm, geared that way, wired that way. I get that from my mom. My mom is a very optimistic person too. But my optimism is grounded in, in what I would say, it's a biblical optimism, grounded in faith. I don't just look at things and just say, you know what, I'm just going to ignore reality and I'm just going to be like kind of Pollyanna, that everything is going to be okay and put my head in the sand and so on. That I believe, and I think this is what Daniel had, that he had this biblical perspective that said, in the midst of all the bad that's going on around me, in the midst of the things I don't even understand, or things I, I don't like, because that's how we see our, find ourselves today, I understand who is in control, and I understand ultimately how this all plays out. We know that Daniel understood he was in a very bad situation. We, he knew what was, was going on. He knew, though, that there was going to be a point, we need to hold on to this, where God would judge Babylon. God would restore his people back to Jerusalem. He didn't know when. He didn't know how. He just knew the promises of God. He knew that that was going to happen. And so even in the midst of all that he was going through, he never lost that. Friends, the word that I would say, one of the main words I would have for you today is we have to have faith. We have to have this biblically formed kind of optimism, that perspective that helps us to understand the long-term picture, knowing not only the things as we see them now, but where these are ultimately going, because all of life and, and, and history is moving forward towards a climax that God has written and God says, this is going to play out the way that I have said. And that foundation, and this is what I want you to hold on to do to today, that foundation in the midst of appropriate concerns, right? Even, even fears that we might have, even dreads of life that we encounter, but it keeps us from falling down and giving up. Some people, when they see change around, some people, when they see even culture change around, they just say, I just want to give up, get out of here. 
But that's not what Daniel did, and that's what we can learn from this. Daniel knew that even in Babylon, even in godless Babylon, God was in control. He, he knew that God wasn't up in heaven saying, oh, you know, man, that wasn't supposed to happen. Gabriel, you, you have any ideas? He's not panicking. Friends, God, it sometimes he directly causes things to happen. Sometimes he allows things to happen. And we can leave it to theologians to kind of figure, you know, the difference between those two. But I'll tell you this, God is never surprised by the stuff that goes on in life. Right. And Daniel understood this. Now, this is a main key point. Grab this down, man. You, this is worth writing down. Just remembering God is in control of who is in control. You get that? God is in control of who is in control. And folks, that changes everything. I mean, we see this from a New Testament perspective in Romans 13, verse one. The Apostle Paul wrote, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Listen, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. World leaders, you know, political systems, those things God has either directly influenced or he has allowed. And so you know, we understand that what's going on around us that God says, I'm aware of it. I'm not panicked about it. Things that are happening that I have either directly caused or are allowed to happen. And all of this in Daniel's situation, it leads to another thing that flows out of his life that we learned. And this, this is important. Sometimes a short-term success of the wicked is God's will. Now that's interesting. And we clearly see that in, in Daniel chapter one. The success of Nebuchadnezzar was the will of God. God was the one who delivered Jerusalem over into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Now, this is really hard for us to figure out. You know, we're just like the Israelites in the Old Testament because our rationale kind of goes something like this. Uh, you know, we're, we're Christians. We're good people. Uh, we may sometimes say, I know I'm not, you know, all, as good as I should be. I'm not living maybe as, as I should, but I am certainly not as bad as those people, you know, whatever the group of those people would be. And sometimes we go through thinking like that, but in the Old Testament, Here's what we see. We find the Israelites saying we're God's chosen people, and yet they often found themselves living in absolute rebellion to God, but still believing that somehow God is always going to protect them because they are, quote, God's people. But what we see in the Old Testament is that God disciplines his own, and sometimes he used wicked, godless people and agendas to do that. All right. Now, he'll deal with the wicked one day. That's a promise in Scripture. But what we always see in Scripture is this. He always starts with his own children first. If you've raised young children, think about this scenario. Let's say you went out as a family to a restaurant, a public restaurant. And while you were there, your kids started just having a fit, disrupting everybody. You know what that scene is like. And as a parent... You know, you could take charge of your children. You could, you could discipline them. You could tell them to stop. You could do what, you know, what was needed. But let's say that you were out at a restaurant and two or three tables over, a booth or two over, somebody else's kids are acting up and, you know, and just causing a scene and all that stuff. You're not going to get up and go to those people that, that you don't know that aren't part of your family and come in and discipline those kids. You're not going to do that. You're going to sit there and just say, oh, man, I wish somebody would take care of those kids. But you, you get the picture with that. Well, that's, that's kind of what we, how we see God working and reminding us in the Old Testament. There's a, a fascinating book in the Old Testament called the Book of Habakkuk. It's only three chapters long. And in that Book of Habakkuk, here's what we see. There's another evil empire, the Assyrians. And they're having great success conquering people. And they are moving a beeline straight toward Jerusalem. And the nation begins to cry out to God to protect them. We're God's people. Protect us here. And here's what God's answer is in that little book. He says, look, I know who they are. I know that they're wicked people, and I'm going to deal with them later. But right now, I'm using them to bring judgment on my people because you've been living in, in disobedience to me. So practically, what does this mean for us today? This is important. It means that when we see culture around us getting darker and darker, Instead of just getting angry at those who are carrying out that godless agenda, and we can be angry against the godless agenda, but instead of us just kind of, you know, directing it toward those people who are carrying out that agenda, we should look in a mirror. 
Because when Christians don't live like Christians, that concerns God. That's really important for us to see. You know, the, the scripture emphasis that we're doing, that Pastor Bryce uh, reminded us about today, 2 Chronicles 7.14 I mean, here's what it says, folks. If my people who are called by my name, i.e. Christians, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and what? Turn from their wicked ways. Then I'll hear from heaven and heal their land. Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 17, for the time has come for judgment and it must begin with God's household. I think that as we see culture around us changing more and more and more, that God says the church needs to look very carefully at itself. Christians need to look very carefully at themselves because one of the major shifts we see in culture is Christians who went from being extremely devoted to God and extremely you know, faithful in their disciplines to pray and read the Bible. Now we have, for so many people, a cooling that's taken place and even you know, and something being apathetic. And then when that happens and we begin to drift further and further away from this, this passion for God and this reliance upon God, then we begin to even question about some of the things how God has told us to live. And we begin to question the truth of the Bible. We begin to drift further and further and further away. And that's one of the big culture shifts that we're seeing in society. It's not just the darkness of the, this agenda, this godless agenda that's putting all these things over here that we say, well, clearly those things are anti-God. It's because we've seen so many Christians who have drifted from being representatives of God, light in the world, and they have drifted, 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 drifted. And so that's how we can find ourselves today. What I want us to see in the book of Daniel is God dealing with his own people, in essence telling them, if you live as though I don't exist, then you're going to experience life around you as if I don't exist. And Daniel understood that. And that's part of why he was able to adjust in this situation in which he found himself. Something else we see in Daniel is this. He didn't panic. He didn't fall into despair because those things aren't from God. There's a time and place for concern, yes. There's a time to be worried. There's a time to be anxious. We can even sometimes feel discouraged, but both folks, we don't we don't live there. And I want to say that to you who are part of our church family because there have been changes even within our own church itself. There are times to say, yes, concern, but we don't, we don't live there. We, we shake those off to the best of our ability through the help of the Holy Spirit, through the truth of God's word, and then we stand in defiance. I told you that Daniel, he, he knew Babylon's success wouldn't last forever. He knew Israel would one day be restored. And friends, if you are a follower of Jesus, we, we hear this, we say this, but I want you to know this. In the end, we win, all right? We may not understand everything in the short term. Uh, we certainly may not like what goes on around us. We may have to live with stuff for years, maybe even decades, maybe even hundreds of years as a nation. But we never lose hope because we know in the end who wins. And when Daniel knew that, man, he was able to live in this different place, different circumstances with courage in spite of those circumstances because he knew the rest of the story. One of my favorite verses in, in the whole Bible is found in Matthew chapter 16, 18. Jesus tells Peter that he's going to build his church, this community of believers that's going to be made up of small gatherings and large gatherings all over the world from all times. And, and then he says this, he says, Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. They're not going to stand against it. They're not going to overpower it. Sometimes we picture the church as kind of like a fortress in this you know, defensive mode with locked gates, and the enemy is trying to break down those gates. But that's not what Jesus is saying at all. He's talking about hell's gates, and he says that the kingdom of God is pressing against those, and, and they're not going to stand up against the kingdom. Gates, they're not offensive things. They're defensive things. And here's what we have to remember. When we live in obedience to Jesus, even when there are setbacks, the gates of hell aren't going to be able to withstand the advance of God's kingdom. Sure, the enemy is going to see some victories, but in the end, we win. Let me give you a picture of this. Now, I'm not necessarily like a huge sports fan. I mean, I like sports. I like to watch things, but you know, I'm not a sports fanatic. But there's one sport, one team I really am passionate about. And I know for some of you, you're going to groan and others you're going to cheer, but this is my story. It's Michigan football. I, I love Michigan. 
And every year on the calendar, last game of the year, we know it, Michigan versus Ohio State. Now, for so many years, Ohio State's had Michigan's number. And every year we'd get to that game and we would be thwarted. Every, I would think, oh, there's going to be a chance we could win. And sometimes it was just absolute blowouts. But that was always the big year. Well, then there was this past year. Now, Ohio State fans, please still love me, but just you'll bear up with me because of this. Last year, Michigan beat Ohio State, all right? When that game, when I was watching it live, I had no idea the outcome. And I'm going to tell you, as I watched that game live, there were times when Michigan did some things and I'd feel real excited, and then Ohio State would score. And in the you know, back of my mind, I was thinking, every year we blow it, and Ohio State has our number. And I just kind of walk away saying, oh, my goodness. But then something happened. Michigan won that game, all right? Now, I recorded that game, all right? And Michigan, it's our, I know it's our one victory we've had in a long time. Let me live with it for a guy, a few moments on Ohio State and even Michigan State fans. But I recorded that game. When I watched it live, there was an uncertainty about how's it going to, to, to play out? What's the final one to, to be? And, and, and I was nervous. And there would be times that, you know, when Michigan would do something stupid or Ohio State did something great. I mean, I just would be so frustrated and worried. I just didn't know how it was going to end. But when I went back and watched the recording, the recorded version, did I have any of those feelings? Absolutely not. If Michigan did something stupid, I'd say, it doesn't matter. If Ohio State did something great, it doesn't matter why, because I knew Michigan was going to win that game. <laughs> Live with me for this. I have watched that live, that recorded game in its entirety, I think three times, because I'm going to take that one victory. Ohio State may have our number again this year. Okay, I'm hoping that the recorded version I'm going to watch this year is Michigan's victory over Michigan State. But just saying that, okay. But here's here's the point with it, okay. Knowing the end changes everything. It changes everything. Daniel knew how things were going to end. He didn't know if it would be in his lifetime. He didn't know the details. But he knew how it would end. And, and that changed everything for him. Because he didn't just survive in his situation. He says, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to be the best that I can be. I'm going to do all that I can. Because I know eventually how this is going to play out. Friends, we can be fearless. We can have a biblical optimism. We can have a life of faith. Culture around us can change, and it is changing. It's changing fast, and the enemy's made advances, and we're going to take some blows. But we are still on our feet. We are still standing strong. And we need to hear the Apostle Paul's words in Ephesians 6, 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Do you get that? Because even though things are dark and may get darker, we know who wins. We are still part of God's church. We are still his light in the world. We are still rescuing souls from the enemy. Never lose sight of that. Walk in obedience to God and see what great things he will do through you. Right? To God be the glory now and forever. That's our word for today.
Friends, I want to thank you for being with us today and thank you for putting up with really kind of a long message, but maybe you can sense my passion in that because I believe it's so important for us today. Hey, did you offer your worship to God? I hope you did. Uh, I hope that you'll continue to do that throughout the day. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to live faithfully. I want you to be a light in this ever darkening world, but don't lose heart because God is in control, right? We win. Listen, I hope you'll be with us next week. If you're in the Ferndale area, I hope you can be a part of our outdoor service that, uh, that Sherry mentioned. Again, we'll have canopies up if you want to be out of the sun. This is all weather permitting, of course. Umbrellas, bring your own lawn chair if you'd like to. But I hope that for those of you that maybe this is your regular place of, of worship, this online gathering. But if you can be a part of meeting together, we would love to see you and just encourage us. I think you could be encouraged too. If not, we'll be right here to, again, continuing on looking at the life of Daniel and some of the things that we can learn about living and thriving during these times. Hey, let me pray with you before we close, all right? God, thank you for this time together to worship you, celebrate you, to be strengthened by your word. I pray for every person who said, God, I want to live and make a difference in this world. And when I see things getting dark all around me, I don't have to be fearful or lose hope. You are in control, God. You're in control of my life. You're in control of my family situation. I trust in you, and I thank you, Lord. I pray you bless every person here, Lord, as they draw strength from you and would understand how passionately you love us and how you are a part of everything that we face. Because of that, we can face it with confidence. Bless each one we pray, Lord. Amen. Hey, as we, we leave today, we're going to put up some links about our connection card. We would love to hear from you. Again, if you're a part of the, uh, the, the chat that goes on, you can click that link and be able to pull it up. Uh, you can text this word CONNECT, and there's the number, 248-600-5426. We would love to hear from you. Hey, you can even just pop me an email, Pastor Scott at FerndaleFMC.com. Thanks to you. Some people are sending letters to us in the church. We love getting those. Uh, hey, if you'd like to do that, our physical address is Ferndale Free Methodist Church, 1950 Woodward Heights, Ferndale, Michigan, 48220. So if you have that and you'd like to send us a, a note, we'd love to hear from you. We would just love to hear from you however it works best. All right. So God bless. We will see you again as we continue to experience life together and enjoy growing with God. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.